I think this is the enthalpy, but you, you let this be U minus uh, U plus, yeah, U plus VP. So you define a new function. I think this one's the enthalpy. And so if you look at dH, that's equal to du plus VDP plus PDB. And du, we substitute from the law here, is TDS minus PDD plus VDP plus PDB. And that cancels, and lo and behold, now the independent variables are pressure and entropy instead of volume and entropy. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing with T and S. We, um, I believe it's the Gibbs free energy that is, uh, well, let's take the enthalpy minus uh, T times S. So dG is going to be dH, which we've just found to be TDS plus D, D, P, yeah, minus, okay, minus dt times s, minus t times ds. Now that the s cancels, and we have uh, the change in Gibbs free energy is the volume times the change in pressure minus the entropy times the change in temperature. So <coughs> we change what the independent variables are to suit what we can manipulate easily in the laboratory, uh, what we can easily measure and control our system, carry out our experiments. <coughs> well, we do a similar thing with the Lagrangian. With the Lagrangian, uh, the Lagrangian is a function of positions and losses, possibly time. But it turns out to be advantageous to hi <laughs> to to um, change from velocity to momentum. So what we want is uh, Q and P. So how do we do it? We do a Legendre transformation. We're going to define, uh, so all right, looking at what we did in the thermodynamic case, we, we let H be, uh, in this case, we're going to let it be minus L plus some stuff. The stuff is the product of whatever it is we don't want, the velocities, dotted with what it is we do want, the momentum. And now, when, when we look at the differential of H, and this is called, as you know, the Hamiltonian, that's minus DL plus uh, the differential of these guys, whoops, Okay, let's see. Uh, DL is the partial of L with respect to, and I'm going to go to indices, which I don't think will bother any of you, times uh, DQ minus partial of L with respect to QI dot, the velocities, times the change in the velocities. Um, then this differential is uh, pi d qi dot plus qi dot d pi. And let's see, that one goes. Uh, yeah, for <coughs> those. 100% among you who know what up and down indices refer to, uh, yeah, P, P actually does emerge as a, a covariant vector. Okay, 
So, how does that work out? Uh, something ought to cancel there, right? Um, what what we're going to have cancel are, is the velocity dependence. So we're going to define, and this is the usual definition. We could have made this definition back here, but um, pi to be the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to qi dot. And in that case, these two cancel. <coughs> and the differential of the Hamiltonian is equal to the sum Q, qi dot dpi minus partial L with respect to qi dqi. Now, uh, let's see. Just to, just to be sure we've done this right. Let's, let's come back here to the Hamiltonian and just check that it is independent of the velocities. Right, so we're going to get the L D Q I dot <coughs> uh, plus P I. Uh, here, there's a Q I dot. Mm -hmm. P is independent. So this this uh, recapitulates the definition, and this is identically zero. So we really have made uh, the Hamiltonian independent of the velocities. It now depends on the momentum. And I know how to do this. I can move my laptop. Oh, yeah. Laptops, right? Don't have to keep wandering back and forth. Okay, now the, uh, the equations of motion are built into this. So if we if we look at this form up here, we can always write h. Remember, h is a function of the positions qi and the momenta pj. So it's going to be the partial of h with respect to qi times d qi plus the partial of h with respect to pi dpi. And that has to be equal to the differential we just came up with, qi dot dpi minus partial L with respect to qi dqi. Now, this, this presence of dl dq is a problem for this equation. Uh, unless Unless the Lagrangian, which is often the case, uh, is the sum of a term that depends on positions and, uh, or depends on velocities alone, like a half mv squared, uh, and maybe some potential. Well, t minus v, if the potential just depends on uh, positions and maybe velocities, but in particular, <clears throat> we can separate out the kinetic energy, then, <clears throat> uh, then it turns out that the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the uh, coordinates is the same as the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the coordinates. Uh, let's see, give or take a sign. See, actually, the Lagrangian, if the Lagrangian is t minus v, where, where v depends on the coordinates, <coughs> the Hamiltonian is t plus v, so we need the minus. Okay, now, uh, making that substitution and carrying out the equality, we see that the dq terms uh, must match. So the, the, the um, let's see now, what is that? Yeah, hang so on, you... Hang on, hang on. Yeah? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, you, you, you get the expression you already have to the right. Um, 
right? You're, you're matching coefficients of these Let's differentials. Oh, yeah? oh, oh, I know what I, I know what I'm doing. Eh, no, this isn't the way I want to do it. I mean, this this is often true, but it's more general than that. Um, if you use the Euler Lagrange equation, you see that d d t of d l d q dot is equal to d l d q. Okay, but d d t of d l d q dot is just um, the time derivative of the momentum. So this d l d q is equal to pi dot by the equations of motion. So we're going to use the Euler Lagrange equation of motion to define the Hamiltonian equations of motion. We can also get them by a variation. All right. But just equating like terms here now, we see that the time rate of change of the coordinates is <coughs> given by the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the momenta. And we see that the time rate of change of the momenta is given by minus the gradient of the Hamiltonian with respect to the coordinates. And therefore, we get Hamilton's equations. Voila. Wow. Okay. Now, Let's see, we launched right into this. <clears throat> I, I want to give a little background about why we're going into this. Because what we want to do is to develop canonical quantization of a field theory. <clears throat> so we're, it's, the starting point is going to be the Hamiltonian formulation of the field theory. And it's really just like this, except that where we have uh, where we have partial derivatives of these functions, um, the functions will become functionals and we'll do uh, functional differentiation, uh, which looks remarkably much like ordinary differentiation. So um, we, can, we can talk about functional calculus a bit, but uh, basically I think I would rather uh, this semester you know, push through to the quantization of free fields using canonical quantization, and then on to uh, some QED path integrals, and then a discussion of the standard model. That's a lot to cover in one semester. So I may leave some of what's in the, in the text to your reading and push through the really salient features uh, to, um, to, to get to some uh, real applications of the models. The origin of canonical quantization, it comes from the way Dirac quantized electromagnetism uh, back in the 1930s. Uh, building, he came up with a set of simple rules you could apply to Hamilton's equations of motion to turn them into quantum equations. Uh, it's um, actually, it's surprisingly, simple feature. It hinges on an object called the Poisson bracket, with which you, you've probably all seen. Have you all seen Poisson yeah. brackets? Yeah, I've worked a lot with them, but I've, I've known yeah, about Nobody's them. worked a lot with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 We've all seen them, right? Yeah. I, I'll, I'll define it all. So, yeah, let's see. Uh, to keep from having to move everything back and forth, I'll, I'll just stick to one board for sure, uh, as long as it's practical. So what we're going to do is now reformulate this in terms of a Poisson bracket. And we can. That might actually be a good exercise for, for Wednesday. Now that we think about it. The, uh, let's define the Poisson bracket. For any two dynamical variables, and here's, oh. <laughs> I can turn this around. You can sit up. I want to use. Oh, can I use that? Oh, cool. I'm going to have to be way over there. Okay. Um, all right. The Poisson bracket 
Uh, I want to stress the idea of... Yeah, I have a quick question, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I read something about an effective Lagrangian and a total Lagrangian. What does that mean? Uh, in what context did you read that? In trying to... Uh, okay, I regards to the Higgs uh, mechanism that I was reading. Ah, yeah. Okay. So they said um, the way we get the fluctuations for the Higgs field, mm -hmm. why don't we get fluctuations for um, some other parts of the field? Like the, I forgot how the question was. Well, the, like the gauge bosons, um, they. Uh, um, a zero value for the field is a solution to the field equation. For the Higgs boson, because you've got that quartic potential, the lowest energy solution is has a non-zero constant, constant value. Yeah. So um, that means if you if you go to very low energy, do a perturbative expansion, everything else looks the same except for the Higgs, which takes on the value of that constant. And that's the effective low energy Lagrangian. Oh, I see. Right? The full Lagrangian is completely SU2 covariant. <coughs> That'll come at the end of the semester. <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that. Actually, uh, there's a possibility. I, I'm looking into the possibility of doing a, a, a presentation, a course this winter on um, the just. Uh, Particle phenomenology, basically, uh, you know, where the standard model comes from, and that, that sort of thing. Um, that's that's still in the works. We'll see. If, we'll see if that happens. But uh, that might be just an ideal follow-on to this. Here we develop the mathematical sledgehammer, but there, you know, the math isn't so much. You know, just how do you get the the standard model has these quarks, these leptons, and what are their properties? How do we talk about? Them? So, maybe. We'll see. Okay. The Poisson bracket. Uh, actually, I guess to motivate this, let's, let's look at the uh, time rate of change of uh, any, um, any dynamical variable. And this is what I was starting to say, that it is to dynamical variables. A dynamical variable in phase space is any function of the positions and the momentum. So <clears throat> any, any object like that is a dynamical variable. It's one of the things you might measure. The, it's the dynamical variables that you quantize. This is a point of confusion, especially when people move from the quantization of a particle to the quantization of a field theory. When you quantize a particle, you, you're quantizing x and p. And it's very easy to mistake those for phase space coordinates. But in fact, they're not. They are dynamical variables. The, the position is vector x at t. That's, that's a vector position that's tracing out a curve in space. And the momentum is the momentum of the particle following that curve. So x and p, when you quantize them in quantum mechanics, are dynamical variables, not coordinates. When we move to field theory, we don't really do anything differently. But now the things, the dynamical variables, are functions of all of the coordinates. Uh, but these are just parameters. Okay, it's these guys that we would quantize in any case. And if you understand that from quantum mechanics, then the transition to field theory is not as complicated. Uh, that said, let's expand this uh, time derivative. We can take partial of f with respect to the coordinates times the velocities plus the partial of f with respect to the um, momenta times the time rate of change of the momentum uh, plus any direct dependence that that may have on time. I, 
So F, uh, F could depend on time as well. Now, if we use Hamilton's equations in this, then, all right, QI dot is the partial of F with respect to, or of H with respect to the momenta. Now we're summing down here. We're summing up there before. So we've gotten rid of the Q dot. And then we get minus the partial F with respect to the momenta times the partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to the coordinates and the possible direct time dependence. <coughs> this quantity, where we take, we have two, two dynamical variables. We take the partials of one with respect to the coordinates of the other with respect to the momenta. And then we interchange. It's an anti-symmetric product, and we define that to be the Poisson bracket of F with H. And then we carry along the time derivative. And in general, for any two dynamical variables, we define that same form of the Poisson bracket. And here is where I run into my first dilemma with all this. Um, in my notes, I've used the opposite sign to define the Poisson bracket, which doesn't really make a whole lot of difference, except sometimes your sign conventions, by the time you get into the quantum field theory, get really testy. <laughs> you know, you, you've got to be careful with them. You'd like them to work out. So I'm a little worried that I'm, I'm using the, the opposite definition in these notes because somewhere later on we're going we're gonna to need it to be the negative of that. And so uh, and that would simply mean putting a minus sign in this time derivative here. It would introduce a sign into some of the Poisson, well, each of the Poisson brackets, basically. Um, I don't know if that'll be a problem or not. For now, let's let's leave it like this. And so we have a, an expression for the time evolution of any dynamical variable in terms of the Poisson bracket and uh, the possible direct time dependence. It turns out that we can write uh, all of the uh, essential equations of of Hamiltonian mechanics using Poisson brackets. So let's let's do that. Okay, yeah, let's leave the equations here. Um, <clears throat> suppose we look at the time evolution of the coordinates. All right, uh, this is. This is dQ dt, and let's see, why is it dQ dt? Uh, because that's how we compute the, the time rate of change. Let's see, okay, this incorporates the minus sign. So, you know, I'm going to just, I'm just going to put the sign this way so that the h goes there. I, I'm, too worried that I did that for a reason. So, so we're going to design a, 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 we're going to define our plus on brackets with a funny sign. Okay. So now, uh, is there a partial of q with respect to t here? No. Q is a coordinate. Right. It's just a parameter of the motion, like t. T is also a parameter of the motion. All right. <coughs> Dynamical variables depend on. Well, the space-time point, you know, really Q, Q alpha, and the, the momentum <coughs> might depend on the energy too. You know, we could we could do a relativistic phase space and be talking about something like this. So, <coughs> so we don't have the partial with respect to time, but what we do have is uh, the partial of 
and which way did I do it here, of H with respect to PI. Now, now we'll find out if this really worked. Uh, Q with respect to Q P. Uh, yeah, let's let's get A here. Yeah. QJ minus partial H with respect to QJ, partial of QI with respect to Q. Okay. Sorry, P. We're on the P's now. Right. PJ. 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 QI. Did I get the C's in the right position? Okay. Everybody with me here? Yeah. All right. So um, we are. We're now. This takes place in phase space. All right. We're now in a, a six-dimensional space uh, spanned by position and momentum coordinates. What's the QDP? Zero. zero, right. Those are independent coordinates. So this is zero. DQI, DQJ? Delta J. Chronic or delta? Mm -hmm. All right, so this is delta J, and what we get is partial H with respect to P and I mm -hmm. is DQDT, and lo and behold, that is one of Hamilton's equations with the right sign. So maybe, maybe I, think I, I think I wanted to have the the H first in this evolutionary uh, equation. So we're coming out with the right sign here. And now we, we check PI dot. Uh, that should be the Poisson bracket of H with P. And of course that's going to work too. We have the H, DP, J, and DPI, DQ, Q, J, which is zero. Minus D H D Q Q J D P I D P J, and this is Kronecker J I. We sum over J. Oh, everybody good with summing repeated indices? I don't have to put all these things yeah. in everything. Sure. You know, that would be tedious. okay. Good. So, so we get minus the partial of H with respect to Q I. So we recover both of Hamilton's equations, now written in terms of the Poisson bracket. Question. Yes. Good. Uh, see, the way you wrote uh, this expression right here, here. So D, DF, no, DF, DT? Yeah, here. So you put a time dependence on the other side, and so, yeah. right? So we have the same thing on both sides of the equations? No. Uh, this is a total derivative, that's a partial. Oh, oh. All right. Yeah, missed that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the total time derivative yes yeah. depends on the partial. Right. The explicit time dependence. Sure. Of that one there. But then these are evolving in time. Yeah. So, so you get other defined. In time my head, I have to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good question. Are there any other questions? How did the um? So there, it it goes from being like Q I dot to partial H partial P I. How did that happen? Uh, I used Hamilton's equations. Mm -hmm. Oh, just those in there. Okay. Yeah, just Great. use Hamilton's equations. Okay, any other questions? This is good. Do the whole class on questions. <laughs> okay. So, uh, there are some nice formal properties of these things. Okay, if I erase here. No, this is... <clears throat> What's that? I'm saying it's on YouTube, so we're good. <laughs> oh, <God>. we're, <laughs> we'll revisit it. For all the world to see. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's look at uh, the, the Poisson bracket of any dynamical variable with a constant. And what do we get? Both partials of the constants vanish, so that's zero. Another property, uh, the uh, linearity. So if I have the Poisson bracket, and I write this of a linear combination of two functions with some dynamical variable g, and it, it's linear on both arguments, uh, the constant just comes out, and we get the bracket of f1 with g plus the other constant times the bracket of f2 with g. 
n turns out it's Leibniz. It satisfies the product rule. So if I take the bracket of product f1, f2 with any dynamical variable g, what happens? It's going to give me, uh, let, let me see if order matters here. It's just the, um, yeah, it's just one times the bracket with the other. And the other with the bracket of the one. Yeah. So, uh, what what else has those properties? Anybody? The derivative. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Anything with these properties is called a derivation. So, the, the Poisson bracket is a derivation. Um, Holding one of the arguments fixed? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, fixing so, the then you get a derivation. So, basically, you know, F is a derivation. That's right. Oh, that was close. That almost came out of privation. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, a derivation is a generalization of a derivative. Uh, you have experienced numerous of them because every covariant derivative we've ever worked with is a derivation. It has linear limits and uh, properties on constants that uh, make it do what we expect derivative operators to do. If you, if you try to construct something that has the properties of a derivation uh, along the lines of the way we've constructed covariant derivatives by adding a connection, you will find it very hard to do anything different. You know, that's, that's pretty much all you can do. Uh, proof of that would be nice. But, uh, I don't have one off the top of my head. Okay, there are other properties of the Poisson bracket. Uh, it's anti-symmetric. Question? Oh, it's just that it was earlier. Oh, okay. was there something? No, oh, you're good. Oh, okay. It was just something you erased that I was copying. Oh, all right. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, you know, F with G. I mean, you look at the definition, it's obvious it's anti symmetric. If I interchange the two functions, I get the opposite sign. That's, that's why if I put the Hamiltonian first, I needed the minus sign. Uh, it also satisfies this uh, triple identity, the Jacobi identity. So if I take any three functions and cycle them, adding the results, I get zero. And that's that's probably straightforward to prove. That would be a good exercise for Wednesday. Uh, prove, like, prove all of this. Uh, well, that starts to sound very much like what? A Lie algebra. Why is it not a Lie algebra? Well, it's infinite dimensional. But very good. <laughs> very good. Yeah. These guys probably didn't know that. Oh. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's uh, a Lie algebra is a finite dimensional vector space yeah. that satisfies a, an anti-symmetric product and the Jacobi identity. And that gives rise to a Lie group through exponentiation. Uh, this is acting on a function space. There, are, This is an infinite dimensional space, the space of dynamical variables. And so it's not technically a Lie algebra. Is there a name for that object? I think it's called the Poisson algebra. Poisson algebra. Makes sense? Yeah. Poisson bracket? Yes. Poisson algebra. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, do we get to 
Hang on, let me let me just uh, scan the notes a minute. Um, this children. Yes, this is one of the things I get dealt with. Okay, let's see. So, do those five properties make it a derivation then? Or just no, those uh, original those three? Those three. Those, those three. three. These two it, make it not quite a Lie algebra. Okay. Constants of the motion. Suppose. Suppose we have two constants of the motion. What are we mean by that? Conserve momentum, conserved energy. Examples, yeah. Um, we mean they don't change with time. Their total time derivative is zero. So they might be anything. I mean, they're probably going to be, you know, a couple of those. Momentum in the x direction, momentum in the y direction or something. <clears throat> but then... Their Poisson bracket is also a constant of the motion. So we should set about trying to prove that. Let's see. Oh, it's a few lines. Shall I prove it? You guys want to prove it? Yeah? Sure? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you guys prove that? So, yeah. Prove that the Poisson bracket of two constants of the motion is... Uh, a constant of the motion. Proof left to reader. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. The uh, the last thing we want to do in uh, reviewing Hamiltonian dynamics is to um, to look at canonical transformations. Oh, there's, yeah, there's so much stuff that we could discuss here. But, uh, yeah, that's the classical mechanics class. So, yeah, let's, let's not too caught up in proving things about Poisson brackets, <coughs> classical mechanics. Uh, the uh, uh, basically a canonical transformation is is a change of coordinates in phase space. So we want to go from some uh, some some Q and or let's see uh, might be yeah, some Q and P to some or let's, let's say Q and pi to some X and P. How about that? So a quick question. I'm still yeah. hanging up on the fact that, that it was suggested here. I mean, maybe I misunderstood that uh, the algebras couldn't be infinite dimensional. Well, you, you, you have a lot of the same properties, right? But uh, technically, a Lie algebra is defined on a finite dimensional vector space. You know, when, when we deal with finite dimensional Lie groups, the, um, the generators are going to um, span, uh, be a basis for a finite dimensional vector space. Sure. Uh, you know, and... Um, but I felt that... A group, the, uh, yeah, if you have a group with an infinite number of generators, you're talking about a, a, a similar but slightly different object. Okay. Well, and this doesn't even have like a countable basis necessarily. It's like a really big space. I you see. can take like any function defined on phase space and compute the Poisson brackets and, and all this stuff. So it's really big. It's really big. Yeah. I, I, where, let's see. Yeah, you, you sometimes run into problems with. Uh, yeah, it's like yeah, like in topology. You, you know, you can uh, a, a topology, among other things, is closed under um, pairwise intersections of. Of sets, uh, so you know you can take two open sets, you know, um, well, let's say you know zero to three, take the intersection with uh, one up to seven, 
and first, no less. Where's that go? One that runs from one to three. No, it's uh, sorry. So we get another open interval. Um, so close under intersection. So our usual notion of open sets uh, on the real line is uh, fine under finite intersections. But suppose we do, you know, uh, a whole lot of intersections. Let's let's take some infinite number of intersections. Uh, let me start with. Well, then you're going to struggle with, you know, covers. You know, I mean, if if you're if you're eventually leading, going to try to describe a manifold or whatever, then you will need like infinite covers over, like. Well, there are an infinite. I, I mean, it takes an infinite number mm -hmm. of these to cover the real line. Right? That's fine. But where you run into problems is that uh, an infinite intersection of open sets. What's what is what is this infinite intersection? Zero. The set zero. That's closed. Yeah. So an infinite intersection of open sets can be closed. Right. Right. So you you don't allow infinite intersections. Um, so that's kind of you broken. can you can run into problems like that when you move to infinite dimensional vector spaces too. And I'm not like up on it, but yeah, yeah. You know, that's think, the that's the kind of thing that could go wrong. I'm pretty sure I think that's built into the definition of a topological space. It is. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah, so you, you do, you know, you can do pairwise intersections, which means you can do some finite number of intersections. Uh, you can do arbitrary unions. You don't have the problem there. And that's about all it takes to be a topology. That mm -hmm. containing the whole set and the empty set, you got it. That's a topology. So <laughs> there are some very strange topologies. All right, so let's see. I'd, I'm not sure I want to go too far into canonical transformations. But uh, I think you've all seen me uh, work through the, um, well, the Lorentz transformations. Okay, how do the Lorentz transformations work? You've, you've, got, uh, you've got some vector length in uh, general relativity, right? You've got eta alpha beta, u alpha u beta. Gives you the, the squared norm of a four vector, right? And now we want transformations of those vectors that preserve that norm. And so we substitute this, uh, so we substitute into u tilde norm equals u norm squared. And we find we've got some lambdas tucked into here. But then we extract the coefficient and say, well, this has to hold for all u, which means that we can throw this lambda over onto eta, and it has to preserve the metric. I'm used to seeing like eta u alpha u beta being like negative 1. Like the dot product, the two four. Oh, if this is the four velocity, this is minus c squared. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. But right. you know, if it's yeah, I, I don't necessarily mean it to be the four velocity here. Okay. Just any, any four vectors. Anything, fine. and then we okay. can take. But right. so, a Lorentz transformation preserves the this Minkowski inner product mm -hmm. for all vectors, and as a consequence of that. We can define a Lorentz transformation alternatively as a transformation that preserves the Minkowski metric. The same thing happens in phase space, right? Where what we want to do is preserve Hamilton's equations. So we're going to allow any coordinate transformations of the now the six or eight, if it's relativistic <laughs> phase space variables, that preserve the preserve Hamilton's equations. Well. To do that, we write Hamilton's equations in the clever way. Uh, oh, man. Let's see. Uh, you have to handle the minus sign. So in, in a set of what are called canonical coordinates, you uh, define a, 
closed non-degenerate two form. The symplectic form, oh, let's see, what dimension are we in here? Let's, let's be in six dimensions. So A, B, and so on, uh, run one up to six. So basically, by XA, I mean XI and PJ. So three of these and three of those. And I define, well, I basically just did, but let me call it Xi A to be the six vector Xi PJ. And now I can write both of Hamilton's equations as the time evolution of this six dimensional vector being given by, <coughs> uh, well, Let's make this invertible, so I've got a psi a b. What I want is psi a b times the partials of the Hamiltonian with respect to uh, the size again. Now, this works out to be exactly Hamilton's equations if psi is basically off-diagonal anti-symmetric chronicles something like this. And without working on the details of the indices, uh, the anti-symmetry of this is going to uh, give, the, um, give that one minus sign in Hamilton's equations. Uh, I'm not sure I put it in the right place. Let's see. dp dt uh, should be uh, minus dh dx. So I probably want the minus sign down there. Is that right? Yeah. That's, I think that's right. Um, so is that like some coordinate transform there that you, you did? Kind of? uh, I'm just de <coughs> I'm defining what, what's called the symplectic form. Okay. Right now, um, if I if I do uh, let's let's see. Um, okay, the thing is, I want to preserve these equations under coordinate transformation. So if I define new canonical coordinates. To be, you know, some functions of the old set of canonical coordinates. Then uh, <clears throat> I want to consider transformations of Hamilton's equations in this form that preserve the equation. Well, you can see I'm going to pick up a partial derivative here when I change coordinates, mm -hmm. and I'm going to pick up a partial over here yeah. if I expand this out. Gotcha. <coughs> I can. I can invert those partials over here and do just this kind of trick that I did here to throw the partials onto omega. And so the equation will be preserved if and only if omega AB is equal to omega CD partial uh, chi A with respect to psi C partial chi B with respect to psi D. And there's the little Same kind Jacobian of thing. thing flying around at the edge there. Jacobian thing? Yeah, the, the partial the partial thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Jacobian matrix, not yeah. the Jacobian. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, we get a very similar uh, condition here in order to preserve Hamilton's equations mm -hmm. over there. So uh, you can define canonical coordinates. I, I'm just, uh, I'm giving you general properties here. Uh, for proofs of this, you can look at my classical mechanics notes, but uh, I don't want to take the time in here to run through all of that. Right. But um, uh, if you have coordinates that preserve this form of the symplectic form, you, they're called canonical. Uh, canonical transformations have Poisson brackets that look basically like this, xi with um, xj is zero, Xi with PJ is Kronecker, and PI with PJ is zero. You know, this is basically, that's a terrible omega, this is basically omega AB. Uh, so you can, you can look for canonical coordinates that are related the way we like X and P to be related, and in those coordinates, uh, omega takes a particularly simple form. In general, it is a closed, non-degenerate two-form. 
and I let's see. And we're very good with differential forms. Two. Yeah, I've gone through your notes. You've gone through my notes. You know where my notes are. Me. Okay, so I, I have more of a question about the symplectic form. I'm not. Oh yeah, sure, really sure. Those. No, let's. Um, what you got? I mean, I'm just not familiar with them very much. So. Uh, yeah, then maybe I sh maybe I should look in a little more detail here. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I mean, like, what do you mean by symplectic? So two properties, right? Closure and non-degeneracy. Right. Non-degenerous, uh, okay, three properties. It's a two-form, which means it's anti-symmetric. Right. I guess right. you need that. It's um, uh, non-degenerate, uh, which means you can actually put it in this form. And it's closed means that, you know, basically that form is integral over your whole space. Yeah. That's, that's where that condition comes from. Does right. the closure affect Hamilton's equations at all? Like, is that necessary to get Hamilton's equations? No, these are local equations. Right, right. right. Uh, but to globally define this thing, you need the closure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you can go through a proof, and you know this is an interesting exercise to go through for the relativists in the crowd. Um, right? You you know that you can find a coordinate. Uh, so take any coordinate patch, take a point, uh, you know, on your manifold in some Riemannian space time, pseudo Riemannian, uh, whichever. Um, you can find uh, coordinates on that patch such that the connection vanishes at P, at, at that point. Uh, so that, you know, doing a Taylor series around that point, you know, it's just the value at the point plus curvature stuff, basically. Mm. Right? Um, there's a similar, uh, there's a similar statement you can make about this uh, symplectic form. The symplectic form, you know, it's an alternative, okay, a metric is a symmetric form. Right. Right? A symplectic form is an anti-symmetric form. And if you ask what it takes, you know, I, I, to try to do that, prove that same theorem. We'll try to prove it in relativity first. But now, uh, <coughs> suppose you try to uh, prove that theorem in phase space for the symplectic form. All right. So what you do, you do a Taylor series around the point. You do a general coordinate transformation and ask, well, do I have enough degrees of freedom to make this term zero? Do I have enough to make that term zero? And so on. You know, you can just brute force do this. Well, with the metric, you find, oh, I've got enough uh, coordinate transformations that I can make the first term in the Taylor series go away. There's your theorem. Mm -hmm. You do the same thing for a symplectic form. You find, oh, I've got degrees of freedom left. I can make the second term vanish. And the third, and the fourth. I can make it look like this globally. Mm -hmm. right? So, so you, the coordinate freedom of phase space on an anti-symmetric form is a lot more powerful in restricting it. Mm -hmm. A symplectic space is, uh, is much more restricted. Mm -hmm. uh, also means canonical transformations. Okay, so what is a canonical transformation? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a locally symplectic transformation. It's a transformation of the phase space coordinates mm -hmm. that leaves this anti-symmetric thing invariant. Mm -hmm. right? Well, <coughs> that's not a whole lot of constraints on it. There are a lot of canonical transformations, right? There are, there are many, many, many of these things. So many, in fact, that you can trivialize uh, classical mechanics, right? The, um, the, the uh, what's the name of the equation? The Hamilton-Jacobi equation mm -hmm. is a step on that route, right? Uh, you can... Um, Oh gosh, how does this so so you look at you look at a general form of a canonical transformation and you find uh, right you can ask all right can I do a canonical transformation that <coughs> changes the form of the Hamiltonian well yeah it's going to change you know you go from you know pi and q to x and p and the Hamiltonian will be some different functions is there a canonical transformation that makes it trivial like a constant or zero or something the answer is yes. Such a canonical transformation actually is uh, directly related to the solution of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So the Hamilton-Jacobi equation comes from asking uh, for a canonical transformation that makes the Hamiltonian trivial. 
So if you can solve the Hamiltonian, the Hamilton Jacobi equation, from, from that you can find, generate a canonical transformation which makes the Hamiltonian constant, which means that the solution is straight lines. And you've just solved every classical mechanics problem. Now you've got an inverse coordinate transformation to do it. You can't, but never mind. It's a, it's a very powerful proof. It's, it's really very cool. Well, also the Hamiltonian has to be of a certain form, too. Uh, what for? It has to be separable. Well, to solve the Hamilton Jacobi equation, you mean? Yes. Okay. What's the theorem? Uh, I don't know if it's a theorem, but there's. Uh, I don't know. This is what I spent most of my I summer mean, doing. So yeah. Okay. So uh, you you can you can explicitly solve the Hamilton Jacobi equation oh, if it's. I, I should say there's not it's, there's um, not necessarily a theorem, but all of the things that I was looking at basically mm -hmm. showed only how to actually solve the Hamilton-Jacobi equation if it was separable. That sounds more like it. Yeah. Yeah. So you could actually do it if it's separable. Yes. But um, I, I think the existence of solutions to the Hamilton-Jacobi mm -hmm. equation is a different matter. I see. Right. So in principle, you've solved all of classical mechanics. Mm -hmm. In fact, you haven't solved anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was easier with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, you know, I, I've in my notes, I've worked out a couple examples. I mean, like simple harmonic oscillator, and it's a whole lot of work to, to you know solve simple problems using the Hamilton Jacobi approach. I think its real power is that it, it, it's its conclusion that you know this is a, a consistent mathematical system. You can solve this in principle. There is a solution. So would it be a better thing to say that if it's not separable, then you can't find an analytic solution? To the thing because if you put analytic, you know, okay, now you you know cut off yeah, part I'm, of. I'm not sure it's, it's that strong. I mean, if if it's separable, yeah, you know how to solve this. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, whether you can solve it for other kinds of special cases is mm -hmm. another don't, thing. Don't. I need yeah. to change the battery. Okay. And yeah, and the, from like all my reading, the real power of being able to solve the Hamilton Jacobi equation is that you can skip figuring out what the actual equations of motion are and just find out what conjugate momentum that you transform to are the ones that are can, like conserved basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. The Hamilton Jacobi theory has everything to do with um, the uh, conserved quantities because, yeah, in in fact, you can show that the Let's see, uh, uh, yeah, half half of your coordinates uh, that you end up expressing your final solution in are the initial conditions of that straight line solution, right? So they're constants of the motion. They transform back into constants of motion that de define the whole solution in your original coordinates. But uh, you know how hard it is to find, you know, all of the constants of motion for for a given motion. Right. So doing that coordinate inversion is is utterly non-trivial. Uh, if we let's see. So what is it? The uh, um, it's H of partial S partial C. Yeah, part, partial S. Yeah. With respect to the P's, is it? Q's. With, with the Q's. It should be only in Q's. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm, yeah, it's coming back to me here. And it's this thing squared, right? Um, oh, gosh. What, what does it look like? Uh, I'm forgetting that. I wonder if I even might have it right here. Um, do you remember after the talk? I think, I think I remember. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, I'll have a look. I think it was that. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's the separated one. Yeah. The alpha is the time derivative, though. Right. Yes. So 
the, the fully general thing is the SDT here. Right, yeah, that's right. And then I do a time separation. I keep, I, yeah. yeah, the form I was working yeah. with was when it was time independent. So I keep forgetting about that one. Wait a minute, there should be a plus there, actually, I think. Is it's minus partial S partial um, T equals H yeah. of block. Okay, well, so here's the cool thing. And then there should be a T in the, inside of H also. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. The a what? A T, oh. A T inside yeah. the Hamilton. Yeah, you, you, could, you could have time dependence there, sure. So if you write the same thing, but leave it as an operator. And let that operator act on S. And put an I here. That's now the Schrodinger equation. Is this where S is the action? Mm. Oh, no, it's, uh, S is a variable generating. No, it's it's the it's the wave function. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that interested. is that is the Hamilton equation. Uh, uh, that is the Schrodinger equation. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think the only difference. In, this is yeah. this is the point of closest contact between oh, quantum mechanics and uh, classical mechanics. Just this shift to to turn the Hamiltonian into an operator on S instead of embedding it there in the momentum. John, welcome. Uh, is enough to turn this into. You know, without the I, I think it would be the Fokker Planck equation, probably. Mm -hmm. um, does, how does the I come in from, unless it's too tangential? Yeah. You'll have me talking about biconformal space in a minute. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's actually not impossible to come up with a a diffusion equation that does what the Schrodinger equation does. Mm -hmm. Now, without the I, make it real. Um, the The problem is you you don't know what's diffusing. You know, there's not some real thing that's diffusing. Mm -hmm. But you can get true nodes and the things you get with waves. Yeah, uh, that has been shown. Uh, the The other thing you can do if you are allergic to uh, complex numbers. <laughs> is to um, go to the uh, the Wigner the Wigner function the Wigner distribution mm -hmm. that's what it is. Uh, you go to phase space, mm -hmm. and let me think how this goes. Uh, you can define a real valued function on phase space mm -hmm. that, when integrated over the momenta, gives the wave function. Mm -hmm. Right, and you can find. Evolution equations for it and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, the problem is you have no idea how to interpret it mm -hmm. because uh, if you use it to calculate a probability density mm -hmm. or use it as a probability density, mm -hmm. uh, you get negative probabilities. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, it's you know it's square in that sense isn't isn't mm -hmm. positive definite. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know it it is. A purely real formulation of all the information of the wave function, mm -hmm. um, just as a, a phase space. Uh, uh, let's see, there is a dynamical variable. It's, um, I believe, it is directly observable. I think people have measured the the Wigner function, Wigner distribution, for for some quantum systems. Mm -hmm. So there are, are alternatives to using the complex, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I. Yeah. Um, but by the same token, uh, you know, it's it's illuminating. You know, you can draw pictures of waves bouncing off square wells, and uh, you know, see that they do give you some images to think about for what's happening. With the transmission and reflection coefficients. Yeah, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, thinking of thinking of things as having wave properties. I mean, there's a lot of history history in that. Right, uh, the um, the uh, use of uh, you know complex waves. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, fine. I mean, we're not afraid of complex numbers. You know, mm -hmm. we can do that. Psi is not some real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the problem? You know, uh, you want to make a prediction psi squared, mm -hmm. and you're good to go. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what is next here? Uh, when did we start? 3.30? How, how long do we go? 
Till the cows come home. Till the cows come home. Till the cows come home. I'm pretty sure that's what you have it. Is that, is that what the syllabus says? <laughs> I don't see any cows yet. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Uh, but, but I think on Canvas it's a 445? Yeah, 445. Yeah. Which yeah. is what time Okay. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, it's 445. That's, that's why I was asking. Um, we could just stay till 5. So, you know, I actually do. Uh, 15 minutes more. Yeah. I, I actually do develop the Hamilton Jacobi equation in this uh, first chapter. Oh, cool. Um, so, let's see. Yeah, I should. Um, I don't know. Do you guys want to go through that, or do you want to read that? Why don't you read that? Yeah, we'll, we'll um, let me let me Any jump in. Hmm? All in favor? We, we I. Ones? That's fine. I, <laughs> why I say I? Know. So I am, I am late. <laughs> Where can I find the files? So uh, okay, uh, the the website is under construction still. Uh, it it is up, and if you go there, you'll find the quantum field theory book as it was after the last iteration. <clears throat> but I'm working on it. What I'm going to do, John, is to, uh, on the notes page of the website, as I'm able to edit chapters, I will put up edited chapters as separate files. Okay. And, you know, you know just read the PDF online, save paper. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, whatever you want to do. But, you know, that that's going to be like the next iteration of the quantum field theory book. At present, the entire quantum field theory book is there. And there haven't been many changes yet. Okay. So, you know, you can just start reading there. But I, I will have an edited version up uh, pretty shortly, actually. Thank you. Which reminds me, my Mondays and Wednesdays are going to be crazy. So, uh... I'm I'm happy to meet with you. Any of you, anytime by appointment, let's not make the appointments for Monday or Wednesday. Because the morning I'm going to spend working on the notes, and the afternoon uh, either teaching or recovering from teaching. So, <laughs> 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 okay, so let's, let's try to aim the appointments for any other days. But uh, outside of that, I'm, I'm happy to schedule appointments anytime that you want to chat about whatever. So. I'm going to skip over the derivation of the uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation, uh, but it's very cool stuff, so I want you to look at it. Um, that's the next section or two, uh, bringing us up to, I don't know, let's see, up to, let's see, that starts on page six, and uh, finishes... Hamilton-Jacobi equation is page ten. In the version he has. Oh, I, I might have a different version. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, I may have posted the one that's not using the full. Is it narrow? The the, the PDF? Is the yeah. text kind of narrow? Yeah, I changed that, but I haven't changed it in the online one. Oh. So, yeah, it'll be shorter. <laughs> okay. The next topic is canonical quantization, which is really the reason we're doing all of this. So, <clears throat> Uh, if no one sees cows, I'll start on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it'll clock is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this was... Uh, John here just showed up, so we're yeah. ready to go. <laughs> we define... <coughs> excuse me. We define canonical there. Start the clock over again. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, I, I already defined canonical variables down there, but let me write it up here again. So if we find a set of variables where the Poisson brackets vanish for the coordinates and give a chronicer for the coordinates with the momenta and vanish for the momenta, And, uh, you know, when we're doing <coughs> canonical transformations, uh, remember these, these Poisson brackets are partial derivatives with respect to some set of coordinates. So, in fact, this can be with respect to any set of uh, coordinates. Let's say we have pi and q here. And you can show that if 
a set of coordinates is canonical in one set of uh, coordinates that's canonical in all of them. So there, there are lots of little things you go through and prove. It's like developing general relativity, right? There are just <coughs> lots of details that uh, you work through to get there. But uh, if the Poisson brackets satisfy this, then x and p are canonical variables. <coughs> and Dirac, in particular, noticed the similarity between the Heisenberg commutator and this uh, Poisson bracket for x and p. So <coughs> he, he formulated a set of rules First, we are going to take the Poisson bracket of any two dynamical variables and replace it by I over H bar times the commutator. <coughs> Next, we're going to take any dynamical variable function of, well, let's, let's do the canonical coordinates first. Uh, we're going to take our x and p over into operators. And any function of those uh, actually becomes an operator itself which we can define as that function of the new operators, x and p, up to order. You have to be careful with the order because now x and p aren't going to commute, right? There's a commutation relation between those operators that is going to be minus i h bar times a chronicer because we've just replaced this Poisson bracket so what, what happens is right, we had xp equals delta ij. That's going to become i over h bar commutator of x operator and p operator is delta ij. And if we multiply by minus i h bar, then we get the usual commutator of x with p. Um, this is all it takes, right? This is, this is the whole story. This is, this is how to quantize a system. We write, we write the Hamiltonian version of the system, and then we replace all the Poisson brackets with commutators times average bar and we let all of the dynamical variables become operators. Why? And it's a quantum system. Why do people use this for the Einstein equation? They try it's hard. They try to say, okay, this is straightforward. Why, why don't well, we just okay. do this and call it good? Yeah, wait till we apply it to say the Dirac equation. And, you know, it's, I mean, there are issues. Okay. Isn't like one of the there main ones that like the metric has its two indices instead of just one? Well, it's got more to do with time and the minus oh. sign that comes in. Okay. But, okay, uh, you, uh, you'll see when we quantize a scalar field or a Dirac field or the electromagnetic field, the way we go about it is to expand a general free uh, electromagnetic uh, free particle solution in a Fourier series over flat space time, right? And then uh, we can do that because the equations for those fields are linear. Oops. <laughs> general relativity is not linear. And, you know, you can't quantize it on flat space time. Perturbatively, you could write a spin two field. You could write the metric as uh, g mu nu is eta mu nu 
plus some small h mu nu, and you know, quantize that field. And you know, expand general relativity field equation for this, and basically you have box h equals some energy source. And that works pretty well. You can, you can do that sort of thing. So the nonlinearity is a problem. Um, in general, interactions are a problem. So for uh, electromagnetism, all right, the, uh, you know, what, what happens, let's, let's take a look, you know, it's, I think it's often nonlinearities that give you problems, because, okay, you've got Maxwell's equations, you know, basically this <coughs> and F is the curl of A, and that all becomes operators, so that's cool. Uh, and then you have the Dirac equation, and we're going we're gonna to talk about all these equations, um, psi, and then that's equal to, <coughs> well, zero. But now you, you want a theory where you've got both these. So this becomes a covariant derivative, um, which means that right, that object is d minus i times the vector potential times psi. That's, that's what that covariant derivative is. So now A comes into the solution for psi. So psi is some function or functional of the coordinates, you know, end of the vector potential. Now, there's a conserved current here, conserved electromagnetic current. You feed that into J. Well, that current is something like uh, psi bar gamma nu psi. That current is quadratic in these fields, which makes it quadratic or worse in A. <clears throat> and so now the source for A is something quadratic in A. So the Maxwell equations become nonlinear. And this was a serious problem <coughs> uh, for Dirac. It was basically solved by uh, Feynman, who developed a consistent perturbation theory with the path integral. So what the path integral does is says, okay, I'm going to sum, I'm going to sum this over all, all histories of, of my electromagnetic field and my uh, spinner fields, the I over H bar, I'm not sure which sign we want, but basically the action goes here. The action <coughs> functional goes here. Sure. And you're going to sum that over all field configurations, all physical field configurations, so you have to worry about gauge transformations a lot. But, you know, basically, okay, this lets us quantize the thing. But more than that, I can write the action as uh, the free action plus a, a potential piece. And now, with a bit of work, I can uh, separate that exponential. And I can expand the V part which is generally, uh, you know, has some small thing like the fine structure constant sitting there. Mm. I can expand that in the Taylor series. And I can work term by term to incorporate the effect of that potential uh, in modifying the free particle evolution. That's basically how the path integral works. And that is great when that constant is 1 over 137-ish. It's a problem for the strong interaction where that constant is about one, and you know there's there's no convergence in sight. Um, now for gravity for this to work, yeah, I, this has been written. What uh, what has been rigorously shown is, uh, and this by who was it? Was it Hartland Hawking? Might have been. I believe in the 70s, show that, okay, if you go ahead and do this where you're summing over the metric as well, what happens is that the metric contribution only comes in at second order. Hmm. The first order corrections you get here uh, are effectively just doing quantum field theory on a curved background, but a, a non-quantized background. And now there are books on that, how to, how to do quantum field theory in curved space-time. You know, and it was, um, it was, I think it was Hawking, uh, 
I, I know it was Hawking. I think it was Harley with him, but uh, there's a, a famous paper. Yeah, Harder uh, did some famous work <clears throat> with Hawking. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, so, a lot of people did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, um, you know the fact that you can do you know quantum field theory for other fields in the curved space time is a, is a very useful result. Uh, still, there are even if only philosophical questions about. Uh, the quantum gravity. You know, we would like to understand how all of this physics we do hangs together. There is an argument, uh, I believe it goes back to Bohr, that electromagnetism must be quantized. And it's, it's, basically, uh, it, it's basically this type of thing where uh, you, you know that this J is built out of uh, physical fields, atoms and stuff, uh, you know, and you know that that's an operator because you've quantized atoms. So the atoms that produce the quantized electromagnetic radiation, <clears throat> you know, those are quantum. It tells you that the electromagnetic field is going to be in quanta too. I mean, even Planck recognized this uh, in a mathematical sense. <laughs> I don't think he used those words, but uh, the uh, the fact that the sources for electromagnetism <clears throat> are known to become operators tells you that for this equation to make sense, you've got to quantize the, the electromagnetic field too. Does the Bohr argument just come from that MVR equals NH bar? No, that's the Bohr atom. That's mu that's much earlier. Oh, okay. This is this is later after Schrodinger and uh, later. people. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. This was probably the end of the 1920s when. Uh, <coughs> You know, Schrodinger's equation, quantum mechanics is a set theory. Yeah. People understood that and said, what's next? Mm -hmm. And what was next was uh, pretty much accomplished by Dirac mm -hmm. to quantize electromagnetism. Yeah. Right? Uh, and the argument that that had to be quantized, I believe, was due to Bohr. Mm -hmm. that could have it wrong. Okay. So, <clears throat> We have a similar argument in general relativity where the Einstein equation says that these, uh, the Einstein tensor, yeah, sure. second derivatives of the metric, depend on quantized energy momentum yeah. right, from, from various fields which we have already quantized. In order for this equation to make sense, one feels very strongly that there's got to be a hat on this side of the equation mm -hmm. somehow or other. And, uh, yeah, I imagine that over the course of this semester, you know, sometime between 4.45 and the cows coming home, we will talk about this a number of times. <laughs> uh, and muse about what really a quantized gravity theory might look like. Uh, that's all pure speculation until we write it down and show that it works. Well, if it was easy, I'm sure the universe would be a lot more boring. <laughs> that it is not. So there you go. Um, yeah, uh, the, you know there is another step after the free field quantization. Uh, you have to define your space of states. So we're gonna we're gonna work through various examples. We'll do uh, we'll do scalar fields. You know, and I think you've already seen some of that from Charlie uh, last year. Then we'll do spinner fields, and we'll have to tell you what a spinner is. So there will be a bit of uh, you know, developing the properties of spinners, and then finally we'll look at uh, vacuum fields. Okay, see you. Uh, yeah, the quantization of uh, electromagnetism, and then uh, we'll do the path integral uh, procedure for actually looking at some interactions, some QED interactions. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's that's enough for today. I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna lose my voice. Is Monday is the first day of class? No, oh, let's take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> so the properties for the police and the babies. <laughs> What's that? We meet much <laughs> for the properties for the person. Yeah, yeah. So for Wednesday. Um, 
yeah, proofs about Poisson brackets. Any of the claims I made that we didn't prove, you know, go for it. Like that DDTM Poisson bracket zero. If yeah, we definitely assign that one. So turn that one in on Wednesday. <laughs>